Now, here's what's happening in my life. Like everybody else, we're changing things around. And I need to uh, give a little bit of a lecture on project finance modeling. I'm not exactly sure how this lecture is going to work. Uh, I had to give a, a webinar. And I'm going to, of course, try for finally, finally, I'm going to really try online classes. But they are pain. So I have to practice. So this is a video about practicing making a model. Now, when I give this model to people, this is not for advanced people. Uh, uh, I'm going to start with some general ideas, not about project finance, because I want to show that one of the real ways maybe even the best way to learn project finance theory is to work through a model. And one of the points I'm going to try to make is that WAC is in project finance. Don't think I always criticize WAC, but in project finance, WAC can be what a crap calculation. It's not relevant because risk changes when you go through a development period, construction period, early operation, completed operation, end of life. Finance and the risk changes, and then if the risk changes as well as the capital structure, you can't use it. In project finance, I my hero is Mr. Merton Miller, who's dead. See, I've talked about him many times. I met him. He came up with this idea that financing is irrelevant to value, but unfortunately in project finance, that's just not the case. Project finance, when somebody puts 70 or 80% of the money up for a project, they are saying that's an enormous stamp of approval. We believe your project is good, and they're from outside of the company. So financing is a big deal. When we measure value, we have to use IRR, which is an imperfect ratio. I know it's imperfect, but not like this stupid Amsterdam Institute of Finance saying it's complete bullshit. You have to measure some return over the life from cash flow. ROIC doesn't work. NPV doesn't work. Well, it's not very relevant. People look at IRR and it's not an accident. Credit, I'm getting a little crazy. And I might put my sister made a mock psychology session with her husband about what an idiot whacked out person I was and she put a video on it and at the very end of this thing I think I'm gonna put that video on it just a minute clip you know of it. all right and uh, uh, finally when we make a model we have to understand that there are two different things we're going to do one is to use it for structuring figuring out how much debt we can put in given the cash flows given the the, the project cost given the equity contribution given the risk. That's structuring. The second thing is sculpting. Oh, no, sculpting and structuring. The second thing is risk analysis, where we fix the amount of debt and then run our nice little scenarios. We're going to do that. And I've already said this, but I'm re-emphasizing, if you want to learn it, working through a model is a good way to learn some of these ideas. Okay, another reason for this, if you're young, you have an interview from hell where they lock you in some kind of a room and they say, make a model. God, am I glad I'm old. Ugh. Horrible. You couldn't even use generic macros in this, probably. Okay, here, uh, here are some issues from the current kind of crisis. We can lose revenues. I've kind of our commodity prices, delays, problems with off-takers, value of assets, and... You know, I'm going to explain some of the key outputs, and these are the IRR, measure of value. I'm going to go through that in detail, DSCR. This is the summary page we're going to end up with. Okay, now when we make this summary page, now here, here's what I'm going to do. I have to stop the video already. I didn't really need to stop it that much, but I have three files. One is a finished file, one is an intermediate file, and one has no blanks. This is the one we're going to fill in. It's got a whole bunch of blanks, divide by zeros, references, and we're going to have to fill it in. And if you want, you can open kind of all of these files. This is going to show us where to fill in the blanks, and this is kind of a final one. So I'm going to open our final case. And it looks like I already have the uh, 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 
case that's uh, uh, <laughs> that's completely blank open and then I'm going to open this intermediate case and the way I'm going to do this is in the intermediate case I've got a whole bunch of little yellow things that we're going to go fill in and I hope that by filling in these yellow things in the in the blank case I hope that you'll get a real idea about how to make this project finance kind of analysis and model without going through every single thing. So that's what I'm really trying to practice. Okay, now if we go, I'm going to have to kind of go back and forth a little bit. So we're going to have these three cases open. If I start with this, it kind of shows you all right what happens if I want to have a downside case and you know I have to structure the debt and blah 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 what happens to IRRs and uh, you know downside case and that's not so good a negative equity IRR and what happens if this is a solar project and I'm going to go through some solar issues what happens if we use some parameters from California how do we change this now there's one little thing I just want to introduce to you about the summary it's so easy this up here oops <laughs> I'm gonna have to do it this up here this is this is like a picture now what you can do is you can assign a macro to this before we assign a macro I better do something else I'm going to before I assign the macro I'm going to copy this just below Okay, and then I'm going to take this and move it. And I'm going to put it as a new cheat sheet in chart one. And I might even put this new sheet all the way at the end. Okay, once I have this sheet somewhere else, then I can right click and make a little simple little macro and say all I do with this macro, it says chart A click. And all I do is put sheets and then put chart one, and this is case sensitive dot select. At least I think it is. And when we do that, it is going to just simply take us to that chart. Now I'm going to, we can put all sorts of spinning or boxes and everything else on here, but then for, for now, the first thing I'm going to do is simply insert a, a, a arrow now I thought I had done this before so I'm already kind of messing up but that's okay I think that's okay and then on this arrow I'm going to uh, um, again assign a macro and on this one I put new and on this one I put simply put sheets now what this means is you can't rename the uh, uh, sheets later on really I think they're probably, you could probably, oh God, now I'm going to think about this. And then I can call this go back or something. Okay. And that's the first thing I'll do. All right. We put this here and we make a simple little macro. You can make these very, very simple little VBA codes and get started. I'm not going to save this file because I'm going to show you how to do that. So that's kind of our, where we're going to get. Now, <sighs> I've lost my PowerPoint. Shit. It's in this one. Okay. Oh, I shouldn't have sweared. I better not swear in this class. Okay. And now I, th there's another file that I'm not going to open right now. This file has all these wonderful little spinner boxes. And this is really much more of a complete file. We have different debt tranches. We, we sculpt according to the debt tranches. That means we have up and down uh, uh, cash flows in different seasons. It's another solar project. And then we understand how much resource we're trying to get. We have an off taker and we pay a price. We pay some money out to an EPC contractor. The green is coming in, the red is going out. And then the O&M contract, we pay some money to for the debt. Well, they give us some and we get some back. Same with equity and we can split up the equity 
And that illustrates kind of what we're doing. And it also illustrates in project finance the sort of things you want to model. Because that blue th a little uh, a bubble up at the top, that's the off-taker. That could be a fixed price. It could be a commodity. Could be the there are all sorts of different contracts you can imagine. Maybe you don't even have any contracts for some of these things. It's all very flexible. There's no very strict definition. The one definition is that the money from this red thing called the special purpose vehicle has to be enough to pay off the debt. Otherwise, the debt doesn't get paid. Equity might have got paid earlier or not later. It's non-recourse, okay? And we can go through some wonderful case studies. And one of the best of all time, of course, is the Euro Tunnel. That wonderful tunnel you can to take the Eurostar in. Uh, um, but it, they made every step mistake in the book. They completely underestimated their volume, and so do other toll roads. Commodity price risks are a subject today, enormous subject today. Shale gas projects have been hit by lower prices, electricity prices. Uh, some electricity plants have merchant price risk, meaning they take risks of the price going up and down. Some projects, very famous, very famous project in India, built by Enron, which was considered the wonderful company at the time. Oh my God, they charged a, a very high price and off-taker simply said it won't pay. Similar story with Spanish solar projects in California. Don't think uh, uh, off-taker risk or political risk is only in, in uh, countries that you might think aren't quite so rich. There are EPC contract problems where you have a big cost overrun that's not paid and that's not taken responsibility that the... the, the, the contractor who builds the plant doesn't take responsibility for the rome subway they found all these little artifacts and that delayed it and made it cost overrun there's an o and m risk so all of these little arrows have contracts with risks and that's what we're trying to really measure with some of this okay i'm gonna i made another video if you watch that fine now i'm gonna go through some of the modeling techniques and on practice again how I'm going to do this. Now, there are some of these silly consulting firm rules. Fast, I like, of course. Flexible, accurate, structured, transparent. And again, keep thinking about your life. Huh. Your relationship. I don't know if you can do it like that. I added efficiency to this because I'm going crazy with looking at models that are horrible. And these things don't seem to mean much. They're general kind of BS until you realize, until you really get into it. And I'm going to have a major meltdown when I kind of go through some of this. So we're going to start now with a timeline. And the timeline in project finance is essential because the project goes through very different risks. It has distinct stages and the value changes dramatically at different stages. That's what we're going to do. And then we're going to start with our operation. And even if some of these models don't really start with operation for some crazy reason, they start with what you spend money on first. But operation, that defines the, 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 the cash flow of the project on a project basis before debt. And that's the first thing to really understand. And then after we do the operation, then we're going to do the financing. That's Modigliani and Miller. That's what you should learn in finance. And that's what gets corrupted by all these silly consultants with their crazy little rules. Okay, so that you can make a time-based model. I just saw that we're going to make a Modigliani model. There's not always one place it's better. Please don't start being bureaucratic about this modeling. Foolish consistency is a hobgoblin, a crazy English word. I don't know really what that means exactly, but of a petty mind. It's a wonderful quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson. There is not enough time for us to work through every single input. So we're going to just work through selected ones. And we're going to start by looking at the assumptions page. And I had better open one more file if it's not open already. Usually it's open. Generic macros and these three cases. So this is the one that's finished. 
this ends the one that's not. And I'm just going to start working through some of the assumptions. Now we have in project finance, financing drives a whole lot. Like I said, it's the stamp on your passport. And when you want to model financing accurately, you got to understand how payments and particular interest is, cal is, is calculated. And if you pay a, debt, a loan off every six months, you wait until you pay that loan off to figure out what your interest is. You don't assume blah, 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 it goes down all the time. We want so we're going to make a one month by one month model pre COD. COD stands for commercial operation date. It's when the project begins. It's the key date. Everything changes, but before COD and after COD, it's like a gigantic change in your life. You start with a development, and then you put some periods of development. This is the risky part of your life. I always say it's like your dating period. You go on all these dates and you spend all this money. The chances of actually anything working can be very low. So after you do this, we're going to say, well, during the development period, we're modeling it monthly. And then the next thing, oh, this is a little slow, unfortunately. And then in the financial close, we're going to use e-date. En français, ça c'est mois de, de, oh shit, I can't remember. Okay, we put the start date of the whole project in and then we use months. And and that's, uh, uh, um, we do that because uh, of February and all these other months that are different. We need a, we need a function for that. And then we're going to go through and have a 25-year life, which can change, and I'm going to explain what these little spinner boxes do in just a minute. But for now, we're going to take this 25 years, multiply it by 12, and then we get an e-date, and we say, okay, let's start with our commercial operation and go for 300 months, 25 times 12, and that's the end. That's our death. It's like this is the your birth date on your on your gravestone, and this is your end date. That summarizes everything. What kind of IRR and what kind of value you make in between is pretty good. You can give that to your children. Now, one of the things I really want to show you and show young people is how to do effective scenario analysis. And the one thing we want to do is not put the basic scenarios in our assumptions. We want to keep them separate. I go crazy over this, and I used to make a mistake on this. Now, I'm going to get this from this scenario analysis. And please, if I forget to do this, when this comes from a different sheet, you want to color it differently. I go crazy over coloring. We're going to do the same thing here. Uh, actually, with this one, we'll take this one and divide by 100, which I'll explain in just a, a few minutes. Perhaps I just shouldn't have done that. Now, oops. Now, oops, I had to uh, press something. I know what I have. I have a little bit of a problem, which is making our model a little slow. I've got to fix that. Uh, okay, so I'll have to remember that. This is why I'm practicing. The next thing I want to show you is in... Modeling, if one of the things I hate is if you've taken an Excel class and if you think you're all good because you use VLOOKUP and ooh, or you, 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 you use match index even, or you use the offset function, or you use uh, um, the indirect function, all of these things I love, but they're all a waste. If you use that too much, you're doing a really horrible job. You really just need the index function. And with the index function, you put in a little area and this time we've got three scenarios called p50 p90 and p99 these are different uh, uh, operation scenarios and you can define them with a little norm inverse function and i've got a whole set of videos describing really how to do a resource analysis and this this little thing uh, changes this little thing. It's called a control form. It's called a control. It changes this number. So, and and I'm totally contradicting myself. Contradicting. I'm being a. I'm putting a scenario. I think a P50 P99 is something you might need in the model because the debt depends on that. And then what we do is we we kind of take the. Excuse me. This is the percent of how much you run each month. 
And that's going to cause some some tricky little issues. Okay, and and uh, it, w- what if we switch from uh, from uh, uh, sheet to sheet, you can see that this goes way up and way down. And if you change, shoot, oh yeah, right here. If you change the start date, since we have a semi-annual period, those up and down things might differ for a different start date. And then the amount you repay corresponds to the cash flow. This is something called sculpting, and it's really important because you want to get as much area underneath the curve so you can increase this equity return to the shareholder. That's the way people really look at it. Let's go back. Okay. One more time. Okay, and then um, <sighs> yes, here we are. Excuse me, that was pretty a little embarrassing. Those are the kind of things I, I, I don't want to mess up too much. Now I have a different kind of scenario. Okay, I left this. I apparently left this one with the banks. Apparently left this one. Uh, some of these computed, but this time, I, I, you know, I was messing around with a different crisis. But what I want to show you is, you might have some things that are not really organized in directly adjacent rows or columns. And this time, if I press uh, uh, number two here, this is a, 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 a an input. What I'd like it to do is take this, these numbers down here. And if I press it number three, I'd like to take it the third ratio, the third kind of numbers. Now to do that one, uh, what I should really do is put a little code number here. I wonder if I'll remember to change that. Okay, that's our little code number. And you put equal choose, and then you press the F4 button to choose it, and then you can choose, if it's one, you can take this one, if it's two, you put another comma and take that one, and then if it's three, you take the third one, okay? And that way, I'm gonna then select this whole area, control down and control right, control R and control D, and that way I can now switch the uh, scenarios. I'm going to go back and discuss these little spinner boxes and drop down boxes in a minute, but they're all driven. They're all driven by a, a little code number. Okay. And now some of these little gimmicks and spinner boxes are a little bit different. What I want to discuss this DSCR. This DSCR says, how much buffer do we have? A 1.4 times DSCR says that the cash flow has to be 1.4 times, 140% of the debt service. So we have a buffer. We have a big buffer, not really a 40%. It's, I'm going to discuss this. And I did it wrong. So we're going to divide this by 100. And that way we can change this really kind of crucial variable called the debt service coverage ratio. All right, that's enough. So we've worked through the inputs. And now I'm going to move from the scenario. Now I'm going to go to the operating cash flow. And and I don't know how necessary it is to really have a little bit of uh, PowerPoint slides. But uh, I want to discuss the timing calculations. And in the timing calculations, I want you to understand again a, a project finance is all about hitting different dates and different timings and the risk going down after you finish developing the project, which is getting the permits, trying to get the government to agree, getting the feasibility, getting the banks to put it in. A very, very risky part of the project. After you finish that, that risk is gone. And then you construct the plant. And when you construct the plant, you have a whole lot of risks of construction cost overruns all the delays, all sorts of risks in construction. But after the construction finished, it's gone. The risk has gone down. 
And then you start operating the plan. You're going to have some hiccups. You're going to have some difficulties when you start. But when you finish, ah, that risk is gone. So getting a timeline is a big deal. Okay? And uh, we're going to do that with some flags and beginning and the end of the month. And let's go to our, our timing. Okay? I feel a little bit of time pressure. I shouldn't. Now... The first thing is we're going to put in, uh, uh, I, I have a little timing calculation with this. Ooh, this is bad. I'm going to select this Alt-EIS, Enter. Please use that Alt-EIS, Enter. That's not from generic macros or anything else. It's just a wonderful thing. Okay, and then we're going to put a flag here for when the P, uh, uh, COD starts. Now, I, I did something a little bit badly on this one and I should have put well we have months 33 months before the COD starts now we when we do that we're going to take this and put less than or equal to and we're going to go over to the left and press the F4 button and then we get a true but I instead of getting a true I think I've learned some things from reviewing a lot and stealing ideas from other people's models I think it's a little bit better to 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 do it like this and so that goes from one, true is one, false is zero, same, whatever. It, you turn things off by multiplying by zero, and then we should have a nice little sum column to make sure that's a nice little check. Flexibility, accuracy, structured, transparency, okay? And then we're going to say, well, let's get this model right. Because what we're going to do is put a month-by-month -month period in the construction phase, and then we're going to put a, a, a uh, semi-annual period after the construction phase. And we're going to use the flag. So we're going to do kind of things in a really nice logical order. Occasionally, you'll use the if function. And you will say, if this is true, that's how you read a one. Then we'll use this uh, 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 one period per month. Otherwise, we'll go into six months per period, which is semi-annual. And then we can go all the way across. Now, I just realized I forgot to do something. What I really wanted to do is start going crazy with this, this uh, generic macros. And I want to show when I'm getting links from other sheets. Now, I could color this uh, uh, kind of differently. I don't know what I'm talking about here. Uh, I did something a little bit wrong. I don't want a sum column. So the thing I wanted to show you here is that what kind of what we had talked about. This, these numbers, when they're red, they're coming from another sheet. They're coming from the scenario sheet. And if you press the control and find the square bracket, you can find where they came from. And then if you press F5 and return, you can go backwards. Okay. Uh, so some of these sheets, and then, and then, of course, I should have said, of course, it's a little asinine. I, the, the numbers in blue, those numbers in blue, they're the, the um, direct inputs. And then you have a little section numbers, and when you, you I call this the they call this the lift or the elevator button to get to the top immediately, and then you can go through section by section by section. I never used to have a elevator button, but somebody from told me about them. I thought mm, that's a good idea. Okay, now we're not quite finished with our our, our period. When we I, everything. When you have a, a start and an end, you you begin with the end, and then the start is the next period, but this time it's the next period by plus one. So that's our first start period, which happened to be what we said it was going to be. And then you have this thing for months in the period, and what you do is you put an E date, and you take the start of the period, and you go up to how many months you want, but you better put minus one to get them all together. Now, I gave you this generic macros that if I press shift control R, you can do it. I've seen people go, you know, this control right arrow down, 
shift control left arrow and then control R. Ooh, and they do it really fast. It's like wizard speed and it irritates the hell out of me. But whatever, if you want to do that. Now, another thing that's absolutely essential is to cre keep track with a little bit of a one and a zero, the flags, the flags for the different periods. We've got, I put a flag for the development and construction, the flag for the operation period, you, you always go to the kind of start date and you say, well, that's got to be greater than or equal to, to this. Or that start date has got to be less than this number. Up ah, F4. <laughs> okay, and then we can multiply by one again. And then, oops, I did just one minute. This is the kind of stuff I'm checking. Okay, I had an error in a test. I had a false negative, false positive, whatever in the heck that is. The stuff people are talking about nowadays, right? Now, you when you set your sheets up, I go crazy with something else. People have these ways. They put this this input up above a few rows, and then they they... You have to go upstairs and look at it, and it gets all ridiculously complicated. Please, some companies just put it over in the left column. It's so good for that. And then that comes from here. I press Control and the square bracket, and then I press F5. It's unfortunately, I'm not really showing you that because you can't see my computer. And then I'm going to multiply this by the operating switch. And that shows, this is again for a solar project, that shows when our project begins to have some capacity. Now, I put some degradation in here and took this capacity and made it go downstairs. I divided it by the degradation. So we go over here, and by the time we start, our, our, our mind is degrading. You know, we're getting older. And eventually, even though it's only 0.5% you're losing, that's, that can be pretty big. Now, this is for people who, this is a little bit different. And I hope I made a whole web page for this. This business of saying, okay, if we have June and we want to find out, we want to figure out what the, the generation is for January, February, and March, and April, and all that stuff. When we get to our operation, you notice that we've switched from a month-by-month -month model to a semi-annual model. Again, that's all driven by the debt. And the sculpting, the way we repay the debt, is a key issue. And that's driven by the uh, pattern of cash flow. So I purposely made it uh, 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 like this. Now, it, you could make a whole bunch of if statements. I've tried this. But instead, I made something called a user-defined function. And this thing, it's called find month. Now, I don't know what to put in. But luckily, I put shift F3. And it says... Put the start date in here, and then put the end date in here, and then tell me what month you're looking at, and tell me if that month is between the start date and the end date. And sometimes, and this, for me, I'm going to leave this as a true-false, and sometimes these uh, uh, little things can be really, really helpful. and. Uh, uh, you, now you can't see, you cannot see it really clearly. And this is June, so we should go down to June. And what did I do? I f I made a horrible mistake because I didn't put little F four things where I should have. Okay. That's called relative something or other, okay? And I suppose I could tell you I made that mistake on purpose, but I would be lying. And then, now this, it might sound, ah, I could have done this myself. I could have been a lot elegant with a bunch of true-false. That's bullshit. When you start with uh, 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 September and it runs around to the next year, these calculations become really, really painful. And I'm just going to show you just for a minute the, the uh, I've got this fine month 
and I'm going to show you kind of, you have to go through and just do a little bit of if statements and do one thing if it's before six months, another thing if it's after six months. It took me about an hour to figure out, and I've got another one that I can't even get, really. Now, here's the big deal. In solar, of course, you get more, it depends on which hemisphere you are, but if this, you're in the northern hemisphere, you're going to get a lot more sunlight in June than you will in December. So we can take this number, now I'm not going to press an F4, and then we can multiply it by the uh, uh, amount of capacity, the capacity factor we have, which measures it's like a, now when I do this, I better press the F4 a couple of times, and then I better multiply it by how many hours I have in that month. Suppose the only problem is a, a, a leap year. Uh, uh, and then I better multiply that by the uh, capacity. And then I've done something which is a little bit tricky. I used to do this, and it took me forever to do it. Okay, and then I press shift Control r to get it all right. And it looks like I've made another mistake because I didn't press a, a, a dollar sign on that little thing. Okay, excuse me for that. And then I press shift Control r again, and it shows you how much you've got month by month. Now, once you get the month by month, you can press alternate and equal and add up all the months together. And, 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 and you've got the kind of the key starting point of the model, which is how much output do we have? And how much capacity do we have? And how does this thing work? Of course, all these projects will be very different. Now, once you have this, you can start with the next groups of, uh, of kind of um, uh, uh, things. And we'll go to our... Uh, uh, so I've just discussed here a little bit of our quantity calculations that we use, this thing called the UDF function. Now we're going to go ahead and get the capital expenditures. And for the capital expenditures, you have to spread out the CapEx. You have to know, are we spending them early? Are we spending them late? Can we put in our model something for the delay? After we have the capital expenditures, I'm going to go through the operating costs. And people get way too obsessed with inflation. It's not really that difficult, but we have to figure out a starting point correctly. Now, let me again, uh, 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 wait, what a perfect time to talk about fixed and variable cost. When I ask people a lot of times, would you have, rather have fixed cost, rather have variable cost? People say, oh, I want fixed cost. I want operating leverage. Uh, compute some IRRs, okay? So let's get to this next kind of group of calculations in the, in the model. And the first thing, I'm, I'm, the, the S curves could get really, really fancy. Right now, all I did over here was say, okay, we're just gonna take one divided by the number of periods in the development. And this, of course, comes from the assumptions page. So these are all easy to find. And then we put an equal sign and we take the F4 a few times, times this one. And these other people can whiz around this like you cannot believe. We take that one and we spread it around. And then we better use our flags that we should keep in sight. The key flags you want to keep in sight. Just like this. And then you press Shift, Control, R. Now I started moaning about transparency in a model. Here's what you want to show. You want to be able to press the F2 key and see exactly what happens. Exactly what happens. Now, uh, uh, um, after you do this, uh, I filled in the rest, so I'm not going to be very uh, uh, redundant. Now let's move to, this is kind of like our EPC contract. And then we have another O&M contract. And really what you're doing in these models, what you are doing is you're modeling the contracts in the context of how the plant operates. And the first thing we might want to do is take our beginning period. And you should really 
uh, be consistent, and our inflation is going to begin here. So I put a greater than or equal sign, and then press the F4 button, Shift Control R. Okay, and then now we we're going. To, I put some periodic inflation. It's a little bit tricky. This is our annual inflation rate, and for some idiotic reason, these people assume different inflation for different things, as if they could predict in 20 years how specific little things will inflate. It drives me crazy. But then we take our our index and put one plus. So we go to the last period. One plus in this case this inflation rate but multiply it inside the bracket not outside the bracket use this to switch it on and off so right now that's going to still be one and it's not going to inflate till later on and you want to put it some a lot of times you might have uh, uh, other macroeconomic variables like exchange rates that you want to really start out with and then we have our uh, 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 total amount we're paying and really, another thing I didn't emphasize enough, I didn't emphasize enough, it's one of the key elements in project finance is to be able to benchmark. You don't have any history. That's a fundamental thing about project finance. You have no history, no history, no history. But you have other similar projects. And that's how you test whether you have crazy assumptions. It's crucial to understand the reasonableness of how much you're paying for the project and how much you're paying to operate the project and how the operate project is working, and you can compare those to others. I'm going to press F4 a few times and multiply that by our inflation index. Okay, and then I'm not finished because then I, I have to adjust it because this is an annual number. Now, I, I, I kind of cheated, but then I'm going to divide this by 12. And then multiply it by this little thing that says months in the period. And I hope you can see having those things right at the top is such a crucial kind of thing to have. And then we have uh, 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 we have our operating expense, and it's per month, and then per year, and we have all a very flexible model. And then we put our capacity in, and finally. Uh, I didn't do this here, but we multiply our operating expense by the capacity. Again, I press the F2 key, and you can see uh, uh, things to do. Now, I'm going to remind myself to make sure the F2 key uh, uh, works in awful thing. Okay. <sighs> mm. Now. Okay, why, why I did that when I'm not going to really save this file, I don't quite know. Well, I'm talking to myself. Okay, now let's introduce you to the lookup function, okay? What I did is I put a, in the input file, I put a, a price that varies by year. And if you use lookup, it is so much better than these other things. And I'm just going to introduce it. You have something to look up against. And then once you have this thing to look up against, you go down to your assumptions page and you click on an entire line. Ugh! Do not click on the, uh, 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 try to use a bunch of F4s here. And shift control R. That's how easy it is to track something that changes over time. I think I put the, the, the constant scenario and I'm gonna, Try to remember that we uh, uh, we might want to put a different uh, case in here. Okay, so let's put scenario three. And in scenario three, this thing goes up and down a little bit. I hope, yes, it's going up and down, and then our revenues go down. Now, I'm not going to go through the next thing too much, but we might want to put in month-by-month -month prices instead. And I did that just during, I, I kind of made a crisis period and put them there. I'm going to skip over then. And then we get our revenues, which are the price multiplied by, ooh, I couldn't really see that. We really want to be able to keep it on, in sight. We put the price multiplied by those quantities upstairs. At least the formula is kind of simple. Now, finally, I'm going to use a little uh, uh, a button here to change this to a true to false. And we, we said revenues applied 
and, and I, I, I need to define this. If it's true, excuse me, I better start right at the beginning. If it's true, uh, with just press the F4 button, then you take the, the uh, uh, um, uh, revenues that you adjusted for this uh, crisis period. Otherwise, you take this. So I, the real point about this is demonstrating that you can change the mechanics. And you try to be very transparent. For me, transparency is all about keeping formulas short. It's about showing where things come from over here in the left column. It's about making absolutely sure that you can press the F2 function and see where everything comes from. That's as F2 is really the key thing about it. Now, the editor is just going to be our revenues. And we're going to take our revenues and subtract our uh, uh, total operation and maintenance cost. Okay? Nothing very fancy there. And then for our capital expenditures, we are hopefully, I, I get obsessed really about this little uh, underline keeping abs all the absolute key things underlined. And then you can take the project cash flow, which is the EBITDA minus the CapEx. And once you have that EBITDA minus the CapEx in, in, uh, uh, in, <laughs> my mind just went completely black. Uh, uh, we're going to, oh, you might use a regular old IRR function, but we can't use that because the timing changes. The regular IRR assumes a constant kind of the same period. So we have to use this. And for reasons that will become later, much clearer later, you, you, you should use the, the, the end of the period. Aha. Uh -huh. So... This is a, a screwed up already. What an excellent way to test things if it's going to work. How are we doing? No, I, I forgot to um, uh, divide up here. I forgot to divide this by a thousand. Okay. Now, before you get into the financing, I suggest you compute depreciation. And this is depreciation excluding any effects of financing and depreciation of the fees and the interest during construction. And what we're going to do to get the depreciate, then we're going to compute the taxes. But these are the taxes on a hypothetical company that has no debt. And you get the free cash flow after taxes. That free cash flow after taxes is what in project finance, in, in corporate finance, what you name free cash flow to the firm. Okay, and that's kind of our first step. And we can multiply. We don't depreciate to an asset, so we've got to go through a little bit of accounting until the project begins operation. And then we can take our depreciation rate our final depreciation rate, and you can look at this formula a little bit to see. I, you have to kind of make an adjustment to make absolutely sure you don't depreciate more than the rate, I assume, the 10-year life. And that caused that bump in kind of cash flows. And then you just look at these abbreviations for EBITDA, which is earning before depreciation, interest, depreciation, and taxes. You take away D and A, and you get left with EBIT. And then you have oh oh god, uh, then you have something a little more. I press Shift Control T instead. Or if you have some negative cash flows here, that's going to create a operating a, a, a net operating loss. And to model an operating loss, you make an opening and closing balance whenever you make an opening. Ever ever ever, the opening balance is the last period's closing balance. And then you can put a minimum function, you don't, maximum function. And whenever this EBIT is negative, and the way you find out if it's negative, you switch the sign from a positive to a negative sign. When it's a positive sign, is it bigger than zero? What this thing does is it just, let's put these two things in, and it just switches that from positive to negative. That's what a maximum function does, and that's why I'm actually going 
through this exercise. And then you, after that, you put, well, let's do the other kind of maximum. We're going to repay. We're going to uh, uh, use the net operating loss when this is positive. So you put a positive zero against here. Now we can do that. And it, it, then it, it just takes the positive. And then we can take the opening balance plus the uh, 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 the amount you put in minus the amount you use. That gives you the closing balance. I used a positive number convention. Now, I didn't do something here because we can never use this operating loss if we don't have any. So we take the max, the minimum of the opening balance, and that's this min max. And if you ever in your work, if you start having a whole bunch of long if statements, that's a disaster. Using the min max is so much more efficient. And now I've got the, the project IRR. Now that's part one. That's part one, and that took me somewhere around three quarters of an hour. And it might take about the same to make part two, but I'm going to stop the video, and we're going to talk about some other uh, issues uh, uh, in, in part two. Okay? Oh, I'm not going to put the psychological stuff in until later because i got to find it.